We literally created a company that allowed my daughter uh, to ride a unicorn. I just wanted to point that out. Um, I want to say a special thank you to the Soulcraft All-Stars. If you've liked all those Chef Comp videos we've ever made, those are the guys that uh, pulled all that off. Let's give a hand for the Soulcraft All-Stars. This is their dope hat. I'm going to return it because I don't wear enough hats, um, and it'll be weird. Um, I also want to thank our lovely DJ, Derek. It's crazy. It's amazing that someone of his talent and skill comes out here. The production company, all this amazing stuff. Okay, enough thank yous. Let's, uh, let's, let's do one more thing. Hi, everybody. I'm back. Do you get it? I like this joke because, uh, A, I'm already here, but B, I just have to wait. Right? This cute hedgehog. You see it's back. The joke totally didn't land. All right, fine. I think it's hilarious, and that's all that matters, because as is evidenced by my daughter on a unicorn, it's all about me. Um, okay, yesterday, uh, we talked about uh, the enterprise that wins, being the one that can shift with technology, um, and that can do that without fundamentally changing how it works, right? Um, I was talking to a reporter yesterday who had the best possible phrase for this, which is that it's like every couple of years we have this constitutional crisis in the enterprise. You know, some new technology comes along and then we have to decide, like, is everything different now? You know, where we no longer what we used to be. And figuring out how to, the, that enterprise of the future is the one that figures out how to take that new technology in and not have that constitutional crisis. Um, you know, we need to build that capability to ship software. Uh, to manage infrastructure, to stay compliant, independent of the technology that drives us under the hood, because the one thing we know for sure is that that technology is gonna change over time. Um, so how do we design for this? Um, yesterday we talked about Alan Kay, um, uh, the father of object orientation and his focus on messages, and today I wanna talk about this guy. This is Mark Burgess. Um, he wrote CF Engine. Um, he's a professor, uh, he has a degree in physics, um, he invented his own branch of deontic logic, which we're going to talk about in just a minute, so aren't you excited? Um, uh, he invented uh, computer immunology, uh, operator convergence. You know, if you like anything that I have done in the last 10 years, you uh, have Mark to thank for that. It's because of what Mark taught me, and it's what he's taught us as an industry. Um, and if you don't like those things, I question why you're here at 9 o'clock in the morning. Um, because it's weird, right? Um, you're at ChefConf, you're in Austin, so if you don't like it, you should leave. Like, you should get up and just go to Austin, because it's awesome in Austin. Um, but you're still here, so I assume that you dig it. Um, also, uh, what I'm about to say uh, is not the professor's fault, if I am wrong. So while I am definitely cribbing from his ideas, um, it's, not, it's not him, it's me. Um, also, have you noticed how photogenic he is? Isn't that a good looking guy? Derek, what do you think? I think he's gorgeous. Yeah, he's, he's I mean, honestly, but he's quite handsome. Um, quite handsome. Yeah, and it's not just this photo. So I've been sort of putting photos of Mark Burgess up on a screen for a while now. Um, and every time I go to look for a new Mark Burgess photo, and I don't know about you, but there's definitely photos of me like picking my nose and like eating food and just like being slobby, you know? Like it's, I'm, my posture is not good. And I literally cannot find one. Um, and uh, I would tease him about this on Twitter, and then the next day he sent me a selfie as he was leaving, like his house in the morning. He was like, hey, boop, and like, looks super good. Um, yeah, there's, there's just a lot going on in this photograph, um, but like, one of the things that I love best about this photograph is that sweater, right? Um, in my head, that sweater smells great. <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, it smells like sandalwood, you know? It's like, it's like, it's like my magical theoretical grandpa. You know, it's just like, mm. okay, is it weird? Was that too much? Okay. No, no. Um, love you, Mark. It's super not weird. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Woo. Okay, let's shake that off. Um, enough. So Mark came up with this great idea, and it's called promise theory. Um, and it's about how people and things cooperate uh, toward achieving their goals. And central to promise theory is this idea of an agent. Um, so agents are people or things that embody some behavior, right? So this could be a service. Um, it could be a transistor in your laptop. It could be a person, right? Um, all kinds of, of things can be these agents. And we care less about what kind of thing the agent is. So we don't really care that if it's a person or if it's a, a, a transistor or a service. What we care about is what promises it can keep. We care about the behavior of that agent in various conditions, right? 
And if we have a bunch of these agents that we understand their behavior, then we can start to understand and predict their outcomes. Um, and it's kind of amazing when we watch this work. Um, people actually work this way all the time. So I'll give you an example. Um, not that long ago, my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer. And um, she's now cured of breast cancer, so hooray for no longer having breast cancer. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that was very clear was that we didn't have to do a whole lot of command and control to eliminate that breast cancer. All we had to do was come into a room and say, I have breast cancer. And then everyone knew that our intended outcome was the removal of cancer, right? That was it. You went to the doctor, you were like, I have cancer. They were like, let's get the cancer out of your body. Like, let's remove that thing. Uh, the same thing happened with her family. We were like, oh, I, I'm on a plane. I will come to you and I will help take care of you. And what do we need? We should buy a recliner and we should do all these things. Huge amounts of things set in motion. Not because we ordered each other around, right? We didn't go to the surgeon and be like, okay, cut here, you know? We just told the surgeon, I have breast cancer. And the surgeon was like, holy crap, where is it? Let's do the thing. And the whole hospital flies into motion, right? And it's because as human beings, we don't, we don't work, we work this way. We work according to intent, right? We know that the role of a doctor is to take care of you. And the role of a surgeon is to actually operate on you and to do those things. And my role as her son was to help take care of her while she was in recovery, right? Um, and together, we got to this outcome that we desired, which was being cancer-free, right? Um, and all we had to do was communicate that intent. So key to the idea of promise theory is the idea that these agents work because these behaviors are assembled towards some common intent. If we understand what we're trying to achieve, what the objective is, then we can use the reliable behaviors of these agents to get to that outcome, right? And the result of this is systems that we can really trust, right? Uh, in that cancer example, um, we could trust those doctors. We could trust uh, the cousin who flew in from Virginia to take care of my mom when, when I couldn't be there. Um, and promise theory works as well for modeling those human behaviors. It works for economic behaviors, and it works incredibly well for technical systems. And so I want to show you how we might use promise theory to talk about a different way of designing how the enterprise works and how the software stack that we run works that might lead to an enterprise that can actually shift its implementation, that could actually balance itself in the face of all of this change. So to do that, we need to start with an example. So I think we should do application deployment. Um, do you guys want to do application deployment? Is that cool? Yay! OK. It's, every once in a while, I get insecure on stage, you know? So I need to fish for a cheap laugh. So you've got to give that to me. See, it just worked. I heard the chuckle. OK. Um, this is essentially the process that we went through for Habitat. So unshockingly, here we go. So if you want to use promise theory to design something, the first thing you have to do is listen to the language people use to describe what they do. So when we talked about application deployment, or just application management in general, um, you have to listen to all the words people say. Yesterday, we saw at Capital One the power of people speaking that same language, right? Giving people a common language, like you get an inspec, like you get with, with Chef for infrastructure or Habitat for applications. And the reason we start with listening to people's language is that language is the key to our intent, right? Hidden in the sentences we use and when we communicate to each other is our desire about what we want to see be correct or be different in our environment. So what are some of the words we use when we talk about applications? So I picked four here. We use words like build and test and deploy and configure, right? Um, there's a bunch more, but I think these are a good first step. Um, if we have too many, I think it's too hard to sort of break things down. So let's just go with these four. So now that we have a little bit of, of language and we understand what problem we're trying to solve, there's one more component in every system, and that is human beings. And so we need some human actors. This is Willem Dafoe. Does everybody know Willem Dafoe? I love Willem Dafoe. Let's give it up for Willem Dafoe. I'm so honored that Willem could be here with us today, Chef Conf. Um, Willem's going to be our actor for the day. Um, a little aside, uh, a little bit of Habitat history for you. So uh, we're in Germany, and we're doing one of the first sort of customer prototypes of Habitat. And we had just built uh, what we were calling at the time the depot, which is where the, the Habitat packages go. And I think Fletcher Nickel uh, was the one who said, hey, you know what? It's like a Willem Depot. You get it? <laughs> Willem Depot. And so you might see some of the original Habitat launch team wearing these shirts that have Willem Defoe's face on it. That's what that's about. 
Also, when you install a package uh, with Habitat in the CLI, you'll see this little URL go by that says, gets getting your packages from willem.habitat.sh. That's the Willem depot, okay? So my favorite part about this story is now that I've told it to you, like, you all work at giant enterprises, right? And so you're gonna go back and you're gonna use Habitat and it's gonna be awesome. And some like, you're gonna give a demo to some SVP who's really important and has no sense of humor, right? <laughs> and they're gonna look at that thing and they're gonna be like, what's, what's, what's Willem? And you're gonna be like, it's the Willem Depot. And you're just gonna move on. <laughs> Don't tell the story, just say it flat. Like, like it's obvious, you know? Like everybody knows what this is. And we're never gonna explain it ever again. So only the people in this room know that joke and it's gonna be awesome, okay. So let's put Willem in the background here for a second. Um, and let's talk about our actual agent. So we've drawn a box and it says application because that's the agent that we wanna talk about. And we've put the language that we determined we wanted to use inside the box, right? So we said it's gonna build itself, it's gonna test, it's gonna deploy, it's gonna configure, right? And Inside of those little squares are the areas of intent, right? Those are the things that we need to document the behavior of our application for, right? Um, and what's interesting about this box is that just from this space, this could be a lot of different things because really any agent that implements those behaviors would fit the model, right? Um, so one example here would be, it could be just a single instance of an application, right? It could be one service that's running. It could also be 50 services that are running, right? And if they all worked together, we could think about it that way. So the model scales up really elegantly, and it also scales down really elegantly, right? Um, it also forces you to think, again, about intent and not implementation. We don't have a box here that says Kubernetes, right? Or a box here that says Chef, right? We have boxes that say Configure or Deploy, right? Um, that doesn't say Jenkins for build, right? It just says build. So another thing to notice is how different this looks than the silos in your organization, right? Um, there's a great quote that I think sums this up. It says, organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. That was Melvin Conway. This is called Conway's Law. So another summary of Conway's Law is organizations are doomed to design systems that mimic their org chart, right? Um, and so you probably have at least four groups, more probably, who own that agent, right? Who own that application and its behavior. You have the, you probably have a QA team. You probably have an application development team. You probably have uh, a separate team for doing production deployments, right? In a lot of organizations. And so one of the things that Promise Theory helps us to do when we're designing software or we're designing how the enterprise works is really eliminate that temptation to design around your organizational structure. Okay. Let's bring Willem back into the picture. So we have our basic actor here, our basic agent, and what questions can we ask of our agent, right? So we start thinking about what is that behavior? So let's say Willem needs a build. He should be able to ask the application, hey, I need a new build of you, something has changed. And the application should be able to respond, hey, here's an artifact of me, like here's a copy of me that gives you what you desire, right? Um, it should be, he should be able to ask it whether it's working or not, right? He should be able to ask that testing behavior, hey, is everything cool? And it should be able to say, yeah, it's good, I like it, right? Um, we should be able to ask it to run itself. We should say, hey, this version of you I would like to see in the world, and it should be able to be like, okay, I got it, no problem. Um, we should be able to configure it, right? Willem should be able to say, can you use this runtime configuration in production? And the application should be able to respond back yes or no, right? It's not very complicated. But look at what happens um, when we pull up another agent. So here is the Daphne app from yesterday, right? So we have Daphne, and remember the stack for Daphne was Nginx, the application itself, and Postgres, right? So in this case, there's a really interesting interaction that you can think about between these two things, which is Daphne needs to talk to Postgres. And so wouldn't it be great if it could just ask the Postgres service where it should write its data, right? It should just be able to say, hey, uh, I need to know where my data goes. And the Postgres service should be able to respond and say, hey, here's the right place for your writes to go. Here's the IP address of my write leader, right? Um, but because we have all of the behavior inside the agent when we're doing the design, we start to see other interesting side effects. So for example, if we know that we have to fetch some data from, that, from the other application, what if at build time we could validate that that exported data that Postgres, that Daphne needs in order to find Postgres, that Postgres would actually produce it, 
right? Could we validate that promise earlier in the life cycle so that a software developer, uh, if someone changed Postgres and it no longer exported the information that Daphne needed to talk to it, would get a break at build time instead of at runtime in production, right? Um, and I don't know about you, but if I hadn't thought about the problem this way, if I hadn't designed it this way, that never would have occurred to me, right? Um, because I think about those things as separate siloed steps in my process, right? I think about build as a separate thing from deployment, as a separate thing from testing, as a separate thing from configuration, and it's not. It's all part of the same behavior of that same application. Unshockingly, that's the design of Habitat. Like, this is exactly how Habitat works at the high level, and this is the process we went through to design it. And we provide that exact behavior to any application in a really easy way. It's why in the demo yesterday, it took so little description uh, to do a lot of the things that it did. Okay, let's do another one. If I click. Uh, how about data centers? You guys like data centers? They're super hip, right? <laughs> Does everybody love a data center? I love a data center. I once was stuck in a data center for a week in Las Vegas, and it's why I love tequila. <laughs> okay. There was also a guy with a machine gun out front of the data center, because there was a bunch of casino stuff in there. That's weird. Systems administration. Woo. Okay. So, um, what kind of language do we use when we talk about data centers, right? So, again, there's a ton of things we could pick, but I picked four. So, networking, compute, authorization, and authentication, right? Just as sort of random layers, right? Um, so what is interesting about this as, a, as, a, as an abstraction is thinking about it this way. So the first thing is, this could totally be a physical data center, right? Um, you have to come to the data center, there's that guy with the M16, I come in, I say, I'm Adam Jacob, he looks at my ID, he's like, yep, you're Adam Jacob, right? He understands that loop. Um, it could also be virtual though, right? It could be Amazon, it could be infrastructure as a service where I just call to that thing and I'm like, hey, uh, I am Adam Jacob. And it's like, yeah, you sure are, right? Um, it could be on your laptop. Right? It could be Docker, uh, it could be VMs, it could be anything, right? Because again, once we understand what the intended behavior of the agent is, then it can scale up and down, right? It can change the implementation of what's inside because the boundary, the behavior, the intent is what matters, right? Um, okay, so what happens when we bring Willem back into the picture? Willem, I wish I, what I should have done if I was thinking it through was had his voice be like reading them out, you know? But, I'm not Kelsey Hightower, but you get to see Kelsey later. It's going to be cool. Okay. So, Willem uh, wants to authenticate himself to the data center, right? So, he would come in. He'd say, hey, my name is Willem Dafoe, and the person behind the glass would be like, holy crap, you're Willem Dafoe, right? Um, and they would totally let him in, um, probably without checking his ID, because um, he's him. Um, but again, this could be to anything. Um, authorization. He could say, hey, am I, can I use this resource? Can I come into this cage? Um, can I use this particular amount of compute? Can I do whatever it is that I want to do? Um, what about compute? He could say, hey, I need three abstract units of compute, please, right? Um, what about networking, right? He could say, hey, I need these things connected uh, inside of this data center. Can you do that for me, right? Um, and we can just look at Willem's questions, and it's this guideline to our intent. But what happens when we bring our application agent uh, up into this picture? What kind of communication would it have with the data center? And so here's our Daphne application. And if we think about authentication, what would it mean for an application to be able to authenticate itself to the data center? Could it say, I am Daphne? And could we come up with a way for the data center to say, yes, you are. I know that you're Daphne. Like, I certify that Daphne exists and I see that you are it, right? Um, what about authorization? Could we ask the data center for permission to run in that place and say, hey, am I, is Daphne allowed to run inside this data center? That could be your laptop, it could be Docker, it could be, uh, it could be a physical place, it could be anything, right? Um, what about uh, compute? You know, what if the application itself could ask the data center for what it needs to run? What if it said, I need 64 gig of RAM in order to function? Do you have 64 gig of RAM available? And the data center could say yes or no, and it could talk about where it should be located. Um, networking, though, this is another super interesting thing. Because we have this agent abstraction, and we have those behaviors that we know can expose their information to each other, um, what could we ask of the data center and how would that communication maybe be different? And so what if the data center understood the services that were deployed inside of it as agents with intended behavior? And could we then ask the data center that what Daphne needs is a network connection specifically to Postgres? 
right? And then it would understand all of the things it needs to follow through on that promise and to deliver that behavior to you by connecting those two services together, right? And how would that be different than the networking abstractions we have to deal with now, right? And how, how much could we swap in and out those behaviors? Um, I, think, I think that's an incredible idea and someone should build that startup because I'd super want it in my life. What happens when we put two data centers together, right? Um, we could have a West Coast data center that talks to an East Coast data center, right? And says, hey, uh, I am the East Coast data center for this company. And the West Coast data center is like, yeah, you super are, right? Or vice versa. Um, they could have authorization to connect to each other, right? We could say, hey, am I allowed to talk uh, one data center to the other as pals? And it could be like, sure. Um, what about compute? Same thing. What if a data center could ask another data center to take a service that lives inside of it and run it in the other data center? Um, not because of the technical implementation of the details under the hood, but because the behavior of running a service was a thing that was well understood by our abstraction, right? Um, what about networking? Um, we could make a decision about what networks need to be routed between two data centers based on the services that are running in those two data centers and this idea of services that are authorized to communicate, right? The abstraction scales up and it scales down, right? And the API boundary is very different. I was having, uh, I was at a dinner last night with Scott Wiltemuth, who you saw yesterday from AWS, and we were talking about the power of APIs. And one of the things that that really struck for me was that while APIs are incredibly powerful, our mistake as an industry has been that we're drawing the boundaries wrong. Right? Um, we're, we're instead building these tinier APIs, or we're slicing them up according to Conway's law, or according to how we think the market wants them, as opposed to the way that human beings want to interact and want to relate to those services. And as a result, our systems are harder to manage and harder to understand, and we have this constant ongoing constitutional crisis. And ultimately, this design model, this path works because it's how people work. We work together because we collaborate around our intent. We say what we want, and then we work together to achieve our goals. This is the roots. How many people love the roots? I love the roots. One of my favorite things about the roots is that the roots, if you go see them live, you know that at some point they are going to jam. Like they're gonna do something that's different uh, than you saw the last time you saw the roots or the last time you heard them play. Um, and that happens, A, because they practice, right? So they're an incredibly tight band that's been playing together for a super long time and they still practice and get together and, and figure that stuff out. But it's also because they trust each other. And what's interesting is if you look at the lineup of the roots, like all the people who've been in the band, there have been a ton of people who've been in the roots. Uh, my favorite former roots member is a guy named Tuba Gooding Jr. Um, right? I wish there was a Tuba Gooding Jr. at Chef, but there's not. And Tuba Gooding Jr. played the tuba in a hip hop band. He would walk out and he would have a big frickin' tuba and he'd be like, boom! Um, and he was pretty central to the roots for a minute. Like it would happen, like you'd be going along to a root song that has no tuba, you know? And there would be Tuba Gooding Jr. being like, I found a spot for tuba, you know? Um, and you knew in that moment that the roots had changed the implementation of the band, right? They were like, now the band has tuba. Um, but it was still recognizably the roots. You know, nobody had to ask them, nobody looked at them and were like, that's oh, not the roots anymore, that frickin' tuba guy came out. <laughs> right? Um, just like my mom with cancer treatment, right? Like, it worked because we knew the intent. The intent was to play an amazing roots show, the intent was to remove the cancer from my mother, and, and together we could work to do these amazing things. And our technical systems have to work this way, right? They have to work the way that this roots show works. Um, and until they do, we're sort of doomed to just have that constitutional crisis over and over. And so, ultimately, this is how the future of the enterprise is gonna be built. Um, because we can scale up, and we can scale down, and we can change our intent, uh, w without changing our intent, right? We can keep the idea that we need to deploy this application, that we need our data centers to communicate, that we need our networks to function, that we need all these, th we need to stay secure, we need to be compliant, um, without having to redesign all of our systems of trust, right? Um, and we can change those agents as well, as long as they make similar promises. And the reason this is important is because, like I said yesterday, the one thing that we know for sure is that everything is always changing and that there's this constant new tide of technology. And pretty soon, that data center abstraction won't be about physical data centers and compute as IaaS or all of these things. It'll be about these sneakers, right? Because 
these sneakers are going to have chips in them. They're going to have CPUs in them. And the first version of Nike Smart Sneakers, I'm saying it right here, they will have a little cell phone in the heel. And it's going to be a super big bummer. Or they're going to do Bluetooth to your cell phone is actually what the first version of the smart shoe will be, right? And they're going to build an awesome machine learning AI that tracks you while you run. And so you're running along, and you're like, oh, it's awesome. I'm going for a run, and it's talking to you. And it's like, Adam, your gait sucks. Like, stop if you're hurting your knees, you know? And you're going to be like, oh, that was so cool. My super virtual Nike running AI told me what to do, right? Um, and it's cool, and it's all up in the cloud. And you're like, man, I love these shoes. And then you're going to go for an awesome trail run, right? You're going to go up into the mountains, and you're going to have no cell service. And all of a sudden, your super AI agent thing just goes away. You know, it's like, sorry, bro, not smart anymore. And you're going to be like, no, it's first generation technology. It's pretty cool in the city, but whatever. I don't know, it's kind of a gimmick, you know? And yeah, right? that's what you're gonna do. You're gonna be like, my shoe gimmick was awesome the first time I did it, and then it was just, now it's not a thing, because it can't be in your life all the time. And Nike's not dumb. <clears throat> Nike knows that they have lightning in a bottle if they can coach your running. Um, and so they're gonna go, how can I move all of that compute and processing and AI and analytics into the shoe? Because the latency is killing us. Right? And if I can make it so the shoe can just talk to you and everything is fine, everything would be cool. But now you have a problem, which is you've moved all that application intelligence into the shoe, which means you've basically taken that data center abstraction I drew for you earlier, and you've made it into a shoe. So what are you going to do now? Because, hey, it's cool. We're all in AWS. There's only one data center abstraction. What's the big problem? But all of a sudden, every shoe is a data center. And inside the data center is a little application. It has to do stuff. And how do you update all the shoes? And how does the shoe know that only Nike is allowed to update shoes? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? It's awful. And it's happening. It's going to happen. And we're the people that are supposed to make it happen. And it's either going to be awful and a gimmick, or it's going to be the coolest thing in the world, and it'll transform everything we do. And it's up to us to decide to do it. And it's just about how we design things. It's just about actually thinking through what that problem will be and giving people abstractions that actually scale all the way down to your shoes and all the way up to the biggest buildings that house all these computers all over the world. And it's not just shoes. I had a conversation literally two days ago with a guy who runs a mid-size oil company, which I thought was awesome. I didn't know there was such a thing. And I was like, well, how big is a mid-size oil company? And he goes, eh, it's like five, six billion dollars. And I was like, that's awesome. Um, it's like a $230 trillion industry or whatever. My favorite part about that, though, was he wasn't sure if it was five or six billion dollars. You know, like if I pressed him, he'd be like, eh, you know, give or take a billion, right? I want that problem. That sounds awesome. Um, <laughs> right now, I super care. So for the record. Um, but, but if you think about this oil well, um, right now, they have control systems. And they have all these sort of things that run these wells. But in order to really understand what's going on, there's some complicated interactions where they take data from this well, and they send it up into like a big Hadoop cluster, right? And they do a bunch of processing, and then it comes out the other side. And those are looking for things like vibration in the ground, right? Or, um, or how, how the pump is moving. And so if there's a certain amount of vibration, I, look, he told me this story two days ago. I don't know the details, so we're just going to go with it. But essentially, um, as he explained it to me, um, if they could detect that vibration early enough and react fast enough, they could just slow the pump down. And they would both save the pump. And in the worst case, they might lose the pump and cause a little mini ecological disaster where oil spills out. Um, and that's no good. And in order to do that, they can't have the latency of sending the data all the way back to that Hadoop cluster going through MapReduce, then popping it out the other side, and 10 minutes later noticing there's an alarm. Instead, they need to be able to do it right there. And these are on systems that are disconnected. They're all over. They're out in the middle of nowhere. They're in the middle of the ocean, right? And how, do we, how are we going to figure out how to run that thing as a secure and reliable data center? Because you know for sure you don't want any random person updating a pump jack, right? Like, only the people who should do that should be doing it. And so. If we really want to understand, if we understand the intent of our systems, that's the thing that's going to turn us into a truly effective modern enterprise. When we talk about digital transformation, we will be transformed when the way we relate to our technology mimics the way we relate to each other as people. And, in, and that's what's going to make you a true digital attacker. This is why human beings, who were, were, were genetically hardwired to collaborate, we want to work together. We've developed this mechanism of language and intent. And we use that to our advantage, and that's why civilization exists. And when our technical systems work that way, 
that is the enterprise of the future. That's the thing that comes next. And that's the thing that will truly transform who we are and who our enterprises are. And that is the future of Chef, and it is the future of the enterprise. And we've been building up to it these past 10 years of my life since this was our biggest conference photo. Um, this was the very first uh, summit we ever held. It's the first conference Chef ever had. Those are all of the attendees. There's not like a secret other set. Like those were us 10 years ago. And we didn't know this is what we were building up to, but it is what we're building up to. And as an industry, this is what we've been building toward since those first mainframes came online, since Alan Kay had that revelation about the messages being the important part of object orientation. We've just been trying to figure out how we can make this thing more human and more real. And at the root of it, it works because it focuses on community, right? A community of practice, a community of effort, a community of intention. And it happens across industries and across experiences. And we learn from each other what we need to understand in order to build those systems in a great way. And I can't wait to learn from all of you and build it together with you. And I want to live in that future of that enterprise. And core to that is this idea of open source. It's really who we are. Um, because if we want to collaborate around intent, if we really want to be able to trust those agents that are going to build the future, we need to be able to see their behavior. We need to understand what's happening under the hood. And we need to understand how it scales up and how it scales down. And so right now, I'd love to transition the stage to some of my favorite people, um, the people who lead those open source communities, um, and have them share a, lot, a little about what's been happening with Chef, about what's happening with InSpec, and about what's been happening with Habitat. Um, and I want to thank you all so much for being with me here. Um, and I can't wait to build the future of the enterprise with you. All right, so first up, I'd like to welcome to the stage, Mr. Tom May. Hi, Tom. Give me a hug. Hello, sir. Tom is an open source legend. Uh, he's been a, what, a, you've been a Debian committer yep. and developer for a super long time. You worked for Ubuntu. Uh, you've run and managed a ton of open source projects. Um, and he has been running the Chef open source project now for at least the last couple of years. Yep. Um, and doing an incredible, incredible job. Uh, I'm going to go sit over here um, and just hang out while sure. you do your thing. And you need that. So we made the handoff. Everything's cool. Yeah. Uh -huh. Awesome. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, no problem. I'm going to sit over here and judge you yeah. like I did yesterday. <laughs> Be kinder to me than Seth, right? No problem. Yeah, no, I got you. <laughs> cool. Um, so I'm here to talk about infrastructure automation. The landscape really continues to evolve. Like Over the last year, we've, we've been building better tools. We've been learning more about how you all build t tools. Um, and the basic unit of what we do is a cookbook. So. A cookbook starts on your workstations, on developer workstations with the Chef developer kit. Over the past year, we've been doing monthly releases of the Chef DK. Um, and next month, we're really excited to announce that we'll be releasing Chef DK 2. Some of the highlights. Woohoo! Let's hear it for Chef DK 2. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> How many of you touch Chef DK every single day? Right? Chef DK2, you know what I'm talking about. You're my people. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I'm ever going to get to do this again, but I just have to tell you guys, I love this. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Tom. Uh, so some of the highlights of Chef DK2 that I'd, I'd like to call out. The first one is artifactory support. Uh, with huge thanks to our friends at JFrog and to Noah Kantrovitz. We're supporting Artifactory as a cookbook store in policy files, in Bookshelf, and in Stove. So if you've got an Artifactory installation, you can just upload your cookbooks to that and use that as part of your workflow. Um, on that note, if you're interested in learning more about policy files, Michael Hedgepeth is talking this afternoon about policies, so you should go check that talk out. We're shipping Chef Vault 3.1. Um, we've done a huge amount of work, and some of our, our friends at Critio have been working incredibly hard to make Chef Vault 3.1 f 
far faster, uh, more reliable, and much easier to use in large environments. We're seeing around a 60 to 70% performance increase in most operations. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, 60%. Come on now. Uh, Nell Shamrell Harrington will be talking about Chef Vault later this afternoon as well, so you should go check out her talk. It's going to be great. We're shipping new helpers and new templates in the Chef DK to map better to the, the, the processes we want you to use when building cookbooks. And we're shipping Food Critic 11, which has much better support for modern ways of building cookbooks. It'll also help you prepare for the upgrade to Chef 13 by calling out all of those deprecations that we've, we've added over the last year. We'll also be shipping new versions of Chef Spec and Test Kitchen and Cook Style, again, to help you build those cookbooks. On the subject of Chef 13, we'll be releasing Chef Client 13.1 this morning. Right, because that's how we do. Chef Client 13 represents our shared understanding of how best to build cookbooks. We've been adding resources for the, our most popular platforms. So if you're on Windows or Ubuntu or Enterprise Linux or SUSE, it's much easier to write cookbooks with support for those platforms out of the box. We've been making it safer by learning from all of you in our interactions on the community Slack, in the success Slack, and through issues and talking to people at Community Summit and everywhere else. So we've been, we've been improving the common patterns. We've been making it much easier to write those patterns. And the ones we hear that are dangerous, that people tell us they use and it bites them, we've been removing those. So we think this is the safest version of Chef Client we've ever released. And we think custom resources in Chef Client 13 are the best way to extend Chef. The highlight for me, and I think this is, this is huge, is that one third of the pull requests that went into Chef Client 13 came from you, came from our community members. Woohoo! Over the six week window where we were building the Chef Client 13 release, an average of one PR a day came from our community. That's, That's amazing. So thank you. And at the same time, our community was, was putting in a massive effort to update all of our cookbooks and their cookbooks to update for the, the capabilities that we exposed in Chef Client 13 and to make sure that all of our cookbooks that everyone uses is, are the best that they can be. Um, Tim Smith will be talking later about cookbook testing using some of the lessons that, that we've learned during that process to, to improve testing your cookbooks. Uh, today, we're also releasing a gorgeous new kitchen site. Woohoo! That is really pretty. Yeah. Man, this is what happens when you hire UX developers. Woo. <laughs> right? Real designers with art, <laughs> talent. Yeah. My first one was Cyan. That was the first chef website. There were two colors, <laughs> gray and cyan. Cyan was my favorite color of bulletin boards. It's my favorite ANSI True color. Fact. Yeah. OK. Yeah. So uh, check out the new site. We've got some great new guides in there as well. Supermarket is the cornerstone of our community. It's where you all go to, to find cookbooks and to share your cookbooks. We've made 20 releases of Supermarket in the last year. Some of the highlights I'd like to, to talk about in Supermarket, um, the first one is the ability to share compliance profiles on the Supermarket. Uh, my friend Christoph will talk about this in a moment or two. The other one 
And I think this, again, is a, a huge way to make your workflow better, are quality metrics. Um, you can see an example of some of the, those on this slide, but they're a great way of finding better cookbooks and ensuring that your cookbook matches our community standards and really is the best thing that it can be. Um, and most of these metrics are bu built on cook style and built on food critic, so you can replicate them in your local developer environment. Let's talk quickly about a community of cookbook maintainers. Adam mentioned the roots and how they, how they change band members, but are still the roots. They still have that common goal. Legendary. So what, we, what we've been fostering and working with in the community are groups who are maintaining some of our most critical cookbooks. We're talking about cookbooks like Postgres and Varnish and HA Proxy and Node.js. And they're really advancing the state of the art as well. We're learning as much from our community members who maintain these cookbooks as they are from us. And so two of those groups are the Sous Chefs and Red Guide. Um, and both of them would love your... Yeah. They'd both love your cooperation and your contributions. Uh, the Sous Chefs will be talking at three today about how, they, how the process has worked for them and how they can help you get involved. And this so process has worked so well that uh, we adopted it from the get-go for Habitat. So the idea that you have this yeah. huge community of maintainers who are just sort of rolling in and out is, uh, is, has been so much more effective, and we think it's really the future of how we're going to maintain those community cookbooks together. Yep. Uh, and I'd like to invite you all to get involved. Um, infrastructure automation is a vibrant and growing community, and it's better when all of you are involved in it. Um, Nathan linked to the community Slack yesterday, so I'd love to see you all there. Uh, and tomorrow we have a hack day, so come to the hack day, write some cookbooks, submit some PRs, and I'd look forward to working with you all. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tom. Yeah, we'll do that. Thank you. Thank you. Tom May, everybody. All right, I'd like to bring out to the stage Christoph Hartman. Christoph. Christoph is the creator of Inspec. Um, he one of the creators. One of the creators of Inspec. He wasn't the only one. Um, but I, I love you, I love Dom as well. I mean, I, I love a lot of people, but one of my favorite things about, about Dominic and Christoph is that they have put in so much effort to understand their customers and to really build a product um, that I think is, is, is changing the way people think about security and compliance, and I'm so proud to work with you every day. So let's do it one more time for Christoph. You need this. Thank you. I'm gonna go over there. So I'm happy to be here today because ChefCon it's time to reflect. So when we talk about compliance automation today, it sounds like it's obvious. We know how this works because we are doing it now every day. But it was not obvious all the time. In fact, like Inspec is now a little bit more than two years old. So that I remember the day when Dom and I were sitting together and just like developing that stuff and we, we, we started doing it and nobody believed that this is even a thing, right? Nobody believed it. Um, so why, we learned it the hard way. So when, before we started this, we worked at Deutsche Telekom, parent uh, of T-Mobile, and we learned, like, we, we shipped everything in an automated way. So we automated AX servers, we automated CRM systems, so all that stuff was all automated, and we tried to move really quick. But then security came and said, oh, no, no, no. Like, you need to follow those rules. And then we said, OK, we can do that. Um, we perceived them as blockers, but OK, we didn't get this at this time. Um, now we know that they have a reason for that. But at this point, we didn't. So we thought, OK, yeah, the auditing thing doesn't make any sense because we do it every year. So we want to be secure all the time, right? So we thought, oh, we are so smart. 
we developed DevSec. So we automate all the hardening in Chef. And which sounds obvious, we solved the problem, right? But we hadn't done it before. So I mean, it was obvious to you, because there you were, but to the rest of us, we didn't do it. I think it's an amazing idea, right? Of course we should harden that way. Yeah, but we started with Chef cookbooks only. Yes, of course. But then we figured, like, don't, they don't believe us. So we were thinking, oh, we're so cool, we have everything secure now. But security still said, sorry, I need your Excel sheet filled out properly. Right. And oh, I hate that Excel spreadsheet. So, boom, automation went away. I used to do mine with a Perl script that would build a PDF, and I would hand it to the auditor. That's how I passed Starbane's Oxley the first time. <laughs> I literally wrote a Perl script the week before the audit. Actually, we failed the audit the first time. It was a week before the second audit when uh, we would have had to pay penalties. And I was like, I got you. Watch this Perl script. <laughs> We can, we can share more stories after yeah. this talk. <laughs> so we realized something is missing in our chain, so we came up with InSpec. InSpec is really the idea to turn the PDF requirements into an automated way. So we, we do infrastructure testing, compliance testing, and security requirements in code. So just for you, like a short reminder, like this is how it looks in a PDF, a little bit better formatted maybe, but uh, this is how we do it in InSpec. So we can just describe the requirement and this is human readable and executable. Of course, like we can extend this and add, attach more metadata, but now we have a compliance language and we have everything attached in code and we can even run it. So that is awesome because now we can bring all those departments together. So now when compliance and security departments come in, I say, okay, let's run quickly the result of the PDF document and boom, here's my result. So that is cool because I can scale, I can do this all the time, I can shift everything left. So that, that has been a really good achievement. So let's talk about the, the achievements we have done about the last year. So we have 108 contributors in InSpec, which is really cool. We have about 120 releases, so it's more than once a week. So that is really cool. And the average resolution time is really 19 days. I think we need to improve our stars. So in case you believe me that this is a good thing, help us to get past 1,000 stars. So the crowd is big enough, let's see. Make with the clicky. So you know, I have a tattoo for InSpec. So I believe in it, so you should believe in this too. So we shoved a lot of resources now in InSpec built in, so that makes it pretty awesome to just like start. You don't have to reinvent the wheel, like that's way quicker. We cover more operating systems than ever. Like this is not the whole list. We have Solaris, we have Arista, so a lot more. Um, but something that I would like to highlight is really the database testing. So we can cover databases now as well. We cover network security with a partner, Intelliman Security, so that's available too. Um, and this is really easy to use. Of course, like if you have so many requirements, written in a document, we really want to reuse something, but you may not agree with all those rules and you don't want to maintain all those overlays and special sheets again. So we can do this with profile management and inspect. Check it out if you haven't. Also recently we've improved our Docker support. We had Docker support from the very beginning in inspect, but now we have a complete resource to cover that. So we talked a lot about what has been achieved, but where is InSpec going? And InSpec so far is really focusing on an operating system. And we believe going forward, InSpec will cover the whole infrastructure. So if you think about containers, if you think about Habitat, if you think about Kubernetes, more and more security requirements move into the middleware. So that means like all the security requirements move into the middleware as well. So that needs to be covered. So we are so happy to announce that we have InSpec for platforms soon. So we turn InSpec from operating specific 
to platform specific. So that means an operating system is becoming a special case. The incubation projects are out there. We, we are so happy to have like companies working with us already. In this case, we collaborated with D2L, and here's the team that has done a lot of effort to verify with us that this is really a cool thing. So thanks again for D2L for helping us on that. So this is how it looks like. You have the resources available. You can check, hey, is my IAM user multi-factor authentication? Is it allowed, enabled, not? So same for Azure. We have VMware support. Um, so that is really cool. On top of that, we have the supermarket. Tom talked about it. This is built into Inspec. You can just say Inspec supermarket profiles. You see it. You can run it immediately. So that's pretty awesome because like, this is how we share profiles and you can just run it from command line. And something that I would really highlight as well is the DevSec project. And nowadays, it's not only covering the Chef Cookbooks, it's right. also covering the Inspec baselines. So we have Linux baselines, and especially I'd like to highlight the TLS baseline in case you want to move for PCI with TLS version 1.2. Like, check it out. It has helped big entertainment companies to move the, toward that quickly. So thank you again for being here. Please join us on making Inspect better. Yay, thank you so much, Christoph. Thank you. Wow, Inspec, Christoph Hartman. Woo! Okay, please welcome to the stage my dear friend, Jamie Windsor. Look at you stroll on that catwalk. I was told to walk slow. No, it works. My people. Hello. How are you doing, man? I'm super good. This is Jamie Windsor. Jamie Windsor is the lead uh, of Habitat, um, and he has been instrumental in creating that product. He also is legendary for creating Berkshelf. So let's give it up for Berkshelf. Thanks. Incredible network programmer. Uh, super good at pinball. Never, never play him at competitive pinball. Uh, you will lose. He'll probably take your money. Um, and it's just you're a delightful human being. You're going to need that clicker. Thanks, man. And uh, I can't wait to hear what you say. Thank you very much, Adam. <clears throat> and thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, welcome to another amazing ChefConf. This is my sixth ChefConf. Um, I love coming here every year. Uh, absolutely amazing. And this year, I'm really proud to be on stage to talk about Habitat. Um, we're a year in now. Um, for the, those of you that don't know me, uh, I, as Adam mentioned, I'm a network programmer by trade. Uh, I've also uh, worked in the games industry my entire life. This is the first job I've had pretty much uh, since college almost, where I did not make a game. Um, and uh, I'm having a brilliant time right now. Um, so a thing you should know about me is that one of the things I'm most passionate about is learning to learn. Um, it's been a thing that really has driven me to figure out what, what it is that pushes you forward and what it is that helps you become a better engineer or a, a better programmer. Um, I actually started my, my, my career with an art degree. Uh, I went to school for 3D modeling and graphic art. Uh, I thought that was the only way that you made a game, and uh, that, that's literally why I went to school for that. Um, today I want to tell you a story about how I became an engineer and the first thing, the first program I pretty much wrote. Um, so I worked at this company, Turbine. Um, we made the Lord of the Rings online and Dungeons and Dragons online. Um, I was hired into the operations department uh, working the night shift. Um, and I just took that job because I wanted to get into games. I didn't care what it was, uh, I just wanted to be in games. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I brought to my interview there uh, was that I was a high level player in their games. Uh, and I also crashed their servers and duplicated items and exploited their economies. Uh, <laughs> I think that, by the way, uh, the like, number one rule of being a criminal is not to mention it on stage in a live stream. Yeah. 
Uh, Luckily, uh, those economies are all gone now. Uh, no, that, oh yeah, it's totally off now. Yeah, yeah they're totally we're, off. We're now. good. That's cool. Um, so like statute of limitations or something like that, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, in uh, Atron's call, I used to crash their servers, duplicate their items, and then sell them on eBay before PayPal existed. Um, uh, in <laughs> Anarchy Online. <laughs> you know, Microsoft is actually here, so maybe they could turn Asheron's call back on and prosecute you. <laughs> don't do that! <laughs> John, just don't, no. And <laughs> in Anarchy Online and EverQuest, they used to sniff their packets to figure out like what in the zones were there in Final Fantasy 12, oh, 11. Uh, I used to unlock the doors in the dungeon um, by telling the server that the door was unlocked because uh, they didn't know how to do server-side validation. Um, anyway. Uh, and I was a very high level player in like World of Warcraft and a bunch of other games. So uh, the point of this is that uh, I was very into uh, the high level play of games and I was into these communities. Um, uh, you would call me a hacker, but I was not a good programmer. We've romanticized the idea of hackers in America because we have these cool movies where like there's this visualization of what hacking is, but actually what it really means is that you're just kind of a, a, a hack job programmer. Uh, you could be an amazing programmer, but the thing that you're doing, the act that you're doing, isn't typically or terribly difficult sometimes. Like, just downloading a program, like uh, a, a aimbot that kicks people offline. You're not a hacker, but you have a program that makes you look like you are one. Anyway, um, the first program that I ever got paid for was a tool to find exploiters in the Lord of the Rings Online. Um, because I was so used to exploiting their economies, I knew exactly what to look for. Uh, I also sat in the operations department, so I had the password to literally every single database, and they didn't know that I was making connections to them to build up a data warehouse to figure out, and like build a network to figure out how people were cheating, laundering money, and uh, trading things, right? So that was the first program that I had made, and it's on my desktop, right? It's running. It's a Rails 126 app. That was <clears throat> the very first thing that I got paid to make, um, and deliver to, to, to a, a customer. That customer was the customer service department. And I made this app and gave it to them, or I was going to give it to them, and I came across the problem that sharing my creation was really hard. It was harder than making it. Um, I knew what to look for in the game. That part wasn't difficult. Uh, I figured out Rails, and you know, I, I was a decent enough programmer at the time, like, I was able to at least figure out how to cause a buffer overflow in the Asheron's call servers, right? Um, and I was also able to um, uh, work on like UI for World of Warcraft and things like that. But what I couldn't do is deploy my creation to an environment. And I was in the operations department. Um, I went to one of the more senior people in ops and you know, they, they kicked ass. But they were very unfamiliar with Ruby at the time. Uh, when, when, it was, when we're talking about Rails 126, uh, I made this app and the company literally told me, told me that I needed to rewrite it in a language that wasn't a toy. And that's funny talking to this audience because a lot of people here are Ruby programmers probably. But, you know, 10 years ago, it was not nearly as commonplace. And this is before the rise of what we now know as DevOps. Um, if we fast forward a couple years, it's uh, a lot more common for developers to, to know how to deploy their own apps and, you know, I, I, I started to understand what it was that I needed to do. Um, so a couple years go by, um, uh, and I finally meet a, a great mentor of mine uh, at the next company that I was going to, and he finally, I, I finally met the right person, um, and he decided to bring me on, not because I was a great engineer, but because I knew enough about operations, and I was an engineer. And specifically, the things that I was able to create were helpful for them at the time. Um, at this moment, DevOps hadn't been coined yet. Um, it was uh, a mandate at that company, though, that ops handled the hardware and monitoring while devs managed everything else. Um, so I came into this environment, and it was my job, along with building um, what at the time we were calling the rest gate of a uh, equivalent of like Battle.net for another company. Uh, it's a social platform for a game or a, a set of games. That was my, half my job. The other half was that I had to solve deployment, their next generation deployment for all their servers. And like I said, the dev team did all of that. Um, so it was at that time that I found Chef. Um, Adam's really sweet cyan website just called to me. You know, that's cyan and gray. Then what um, happened? It was beautiful, Adam. You, 
man's a genius graphic designer. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it was like Chef 07 or 08 or something like that. So anyway, I use Chef, uh, and I have been using it for years, and I've built open source tools around it and, and tried to evangelize it. I've uh, come to every conference I can, and it's been a big part of my life, and I'm super appreciative of it. But the thing that I had difficulty doing was teaching it to other people. Um, I've tried to teach probably over 100 engineers Chef now, and it, it works, but it's to varying degrees of success. Like, um, the, the time just required is often insurmountable for a dev who has another job to do. Um, and that's the problem, is like getting devs to both dev their app and deploy their app, right? So I've been using Chef for like six to eight years, um, and the last uh, deployment that I had was successful. But you get to this production cliff uh, where you're just about to deploy, and with Chef, it's useful, it's easy. Um, but you'll pretty much just get 90% of the way there, in my opinion. Um, and I'm pretty sure it's because we were just thinking about the problem as infrastructure instead of as applications. And that's where Habitat comes in. I really strongly feel that Habitat gets us 100% of the way there for automating your applications. And it's because we were just thinking about it the wrong way. We were building the abstraction as operations people, and we weren't building the abstraction as developers. The thing is that micro only works in StarCraft. Um, you can't take a top-down approach when you're dealing with such a large amount of machines or anything. Um, we, I, I bet there's a number of people in this audience that have either tried to build an orchestrator here or they've worked with an orchestrator before. I also tried to build an orchestrator and it's just the wrong pattern. Um, that's what I mean by a top-down micro approach. So it's orchestration versus choreography. An orchestrator is something that tries to give or deliver messages top down and then wait for responses. Whereas a choreography, a choreography is asking a band to play something on stage. You, you say, I'd like to hear this song and they will just figure it out for you. You set goals and expectations and it just happens. And it's because of this that Habitat is more like bio, uh, application biology, cell biology for your applications. It's reactive. This is one of the pre key principles of Habitat and why I believe it works super well. Hey, Jamie. Yes. I love you so much. You need to go twice as fast. Absolutely. <laughs> I so listen to you all day. But these people want to eat lunch someday. If we keep going, it's going to just, oof. They're going to be like, there's no food. It's like zombies. It's an apocalypse in this room. I got you. Get it done. So every cell in your body it's isolated, atomic, and, and immutable. And that's the same thing that we have in packages. God willing. <laughs> Behind me, you see a diagram of the Habitat architecture. Um, the supervisors are uh, gossiping information to each other. They have isolated, atomic, immutable artifacts in them. They receive them from a depot. A moment ago, Adam talked about promise theory, or promises. Those services that are running set up expectations between each other, and they fulfill those expectations. The slide behind me you see is what we call uh, runtime service group binding. This is how you set up those expectations. Services export a thing that they can be and something else consumes them and they bind to them. This allows us to create self-sustaining multi-tier app groups. A little while ago, in 2002, we had to rebuild the world. Um, the CVE that you see on the screen behind me is uh, a vulnerability that was in Zlib. Uh, this problem, meant that basically we had to rebuild every application or every program that was in Linux. Um, there was a double free issue in it, which allowed you to do local or remote code execution. Everybody in this room today has a cell phone in their pocket or a laptop in their lap. The amount of computers live. that we have is, is, is completely enormous compared to what we had in 2002. So this problem only continues to grow. So along with Habitat, with those isolated mutable artifacts, we created a build server that build server rebuilds the software, and not only that, it rebuilds the dependent software. It also helps ship that software out to all of our supervisors. We launched the build service a couple days ago. Um, behind me, you see how artifacts would get, would get rebuilt. The supervisor would pick them up, gossip them around. In a rolling fashion, they'll take turns updating with an update leader coordinating the entire thing. 
Not only that, we rebuild the dependent builds. We perform dependent builds, which is we rebuild software that depended upon your software once we rebuild it. So if we rebuild OpenSSL, eventually Nginx will be rebuilt. Eventually your application will rebuilt, would, would be rebuilt. And then that will be gossiped around the ring. You can also perform promotions throughout this. So if the application's rebuilt, it automatically deploys into acceptance. You can then promote it into a new, another environment and then eventually into production when you believe that it's ready. The goal here, or the feeling that we're, supposed, we're trying to provide is that you come in in the morning, you get your coffee, and you realize, oh, acceptance was updated. Why was ex acceptance updated? There was a new vulnerability that was fixed. That looks excellent. Now let's promote that to production. And you didn't do any work. You just came in, saw that there was a problem, pressed a button, and now production's up to date. Um, and when, because we rebuilt from the bottom up, from the package manager and supervisor, we now have the ability to deliver this. Three times as fast. I've got two slides left. Sorry, Adam. Come on. <laughs> Bring it home, Jamie. <laughs> it's a super good talk. It's got to end. I'm almost there. There's like clocks in front of me, too, and I wasn't looking at them. What happened? Yeah, yeah. They've, just, just so you know, they've been red for a while. I was, like, I was like eight minutes into red, and I was like, you got to go faster, brother. Yeah, they say zero now. Everyone's like, ah. You Let's not talk about it. Finish. All. all right, all right, all right. So these are the project must have a habitat before I came on. I, uh, uh, things that habitat had to do. Uh, it has to work on any infrastructure, physical, virtual machines, containers. You have to provide a singular interface for everything. It has to be any application that you can do, greenfield, brownfield, uh, cross-platform. It has to be Windows, Linux, and we have to measure the time to learn in lunch breaks. You must be able to figure out, oh, this takes two lunch breaks to learn this entire application. Boom. Um, this is our roadmap. It's public. It's pretty kick-ass. You can go on. You can check it out. You can see what the, pu the, the current term, the current things we're working on, the near-term things we're working on, the future-term things that we're working on. Our project board is also up to date. You can go check that out too. The whole roadmap. It's amazing. Whoa. On. And you can join us in community Slack. Oh my and God. <laughs> you can hit up our tutorials as well. Um, thank you very much, guys. Thanks so Appreciate much. Shane Winter. <laughs>